All right, welcome to the Phys Ed Summit 2017. Uh, I am your moderator for this session, uh, Matt Pomeroy. I am part of the Phys Edagogy team, and uh, I am a Phys Ed Summit moderator. So uh, I'm here with a fantastic guest, and uh, we'll introduce uh, Mike here real soon, uh, but best-selling author of a couple of books out there that many, many people have read. Um, so again, excited to uh, be sitting here with him and learning with him. But uh, just real quick here, a uh, couple of little pieces of information that everybody needs to know. Uh, first off, welcome to the Phys Ed Summit, and thank you so much for joining this global event. Uh, we could not make this day happen without you. We're very humbled by the support um, of the summit from each and every one of you. Again, by sharing what you learn with one person, um, we were able to impact hundreds, if not thousands, of students. So again, thank you so much for being here to push best practices, effective health and physical education, and professional development forward. All right. Just a reminder, we are using technology to run this conference. If anything happens or the feed stops or anything else, check the tozzle. Again, that's where all the back channel's happening and um, the, the talk is happening behind the scenes. Um, and we'll get a video going again. But uh, just thank you for your patience, just in case. Um, a quick reminder about the badge system. I've seen a lot of tweets going out there. If you search that Phys Ed Summit hashtag, um, you'll see quite a few badges. And again, you can get involved on the badges as well. Uh, you can earn some badges just for watching, uh, for participating, for uh, just being a part of the summit and uh, lots of different exciting things that you can do and, and uh, learn. Uh, so it's a fun little challenge out there. So it's physedagogy.com forward slash phyzed summit and phyzed summit badges. All right. Again, chatting on that Tazel is a great and very effective way to learn more. Again, but you can also feel free to share this great information that Mike is talking about on social media using the Phys Ed Summit hashtag. And again, there's a Flipgrid video link that we're going to put on the Tazel as well. Uh, so Mike's going to teach us some great things about best practices and getting people physically active in the health education setting. Um, and basically, you can just go out there and you can tell people what you're going to implement that Mike just talked about today, which is pretty cool. If you do post on the Flipgrid, we've got some premium subscriptions for some people that are out there uh, posting. And last but not least, uh, this is a professional development event. Uh, it's pretty cool that we can be at home, maybe in your pajamas still, maybe still drinking coffee. Um, but uh, there's a feedback form that we would like because we want to make this the best we possibly can for everyone out there. Um, and you also get a professional development certificate when you fill out that feedback form. Um, so to get that certificate, you've got to fill out that form um, and check it out on the Phys Edagogy homepage. So uh, I'm here with Mike Kazala. And again, best-selling author of a couple of books. Uh, I'm so excited that I get to sit here and hang out during this session. And uh, I'm going to be watching that Tazel um, for any questions that you have for him. But I'm going to send it over to Mike. He'll give just a quick introduction for himself. And uh, we'll get this thing, we'll get the show on the road. All right, Mike. Thank you, Matt. Um, hi, everyone. I'm talking to you from just outside of Reading, Pennsylvania, uh, about an hour northwest of Philadelphia in the United States and I'm very excited to be here and I want to thank Matt and uh, the Zeta Goji team for having me today. I'm, I'm thrilled about it. Uh, the most important thing you need to know about me is that I come from a family of teachers. Uh, wife, sister, both parents, three grandparents, and aunt. Uh, we're just a family of educators and that's what makes this possible, my passion uh, for education and for you know, putting information out there and showing teachers uh, how to use movement and physical activity more effectively in the classroom. Um, I'm also the academic director for a company called the Regional Training Center. Uh, we offer graduate courses in Maryland, Pennsylvania, New Jersey. And what you're going to be hearing about today comes from one of those graduate courses, the Kinesthetic Classroom Teaching and Learning Through Movement. And uh, we have a second graduate course now, uh, the Kinesthetic Classroom 2, moving across the curriculum. So that's where it all started, and the books came, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so I'm, again, thrilled to be here, and I think we should probably just get going and get started. So I'm going to work on screen share, and uh, I'll be back with you in just a moment. All right. Lots of chat going on in the Tazel right now, which is fantastic. Thank you for um, just sharing where you're from, what you're doing. Um, 
all those great things. And again, I appreciate Mike being here just because this is so important um, in every day in education, uh, get students active and, and learning, but act, active for a particular reason um, and moving for a particular reason too. So, uh, all right, can't wait to learn more. It looks like Mike is ready. I'm gonna click on his screen and uh, get this going. Okay, so we already know who I am. Uh, and those are the three books uh, down below. Uh, just for your information, the one in the center is written for corporate trainers. And so what I do is not just about uh, students, but it's good for everybody. I was in a PD recently uh, in, uh, in Oklahoma, and one of, the, one of the administrators there said, hey, I'm going to do this with my teachers. And I was really thankful for that comment. So it's, we're, we're going to work on health classroom, and it really applies to, uh, to all teachers in all classrooms and even adult learning. So my favorite part of all of this, um, excuse the uh, you know, little guy at the bottom, but the brain-body connection. And uh, for those of you, some of you have seen my TED Talk, and, and I, I start out with this, and um, I know many of you have not probably, so I'm just going to go through some of these ideas about the brain-body connection. Because one of the important things uh, to remember is that learning happens uh, from the feet up, not just the neck up. And the brain-body connection is always in play in the classroom. And teachers need to realize that. Health teachers need to realize that. Um, you know, how a kid is feeling about the information is critical. How a kid is feeling uh, is, is critical. And there's ways that we can manage those emotional states, which we'll talk about in a little bit. Um, so just to give you a couple, a couple of examples, uh, biomedical researchers uh, now know that cortisol, which is a powerful homo hormonal byproduct of stress, is also a powerful immune cell inhibitor. So as teachers, what does that mean for us? So we you know, put the accelerator down too long and you know, raise the danger flag too often, and we go, 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 go. And we were used to living at a certain level. Uh, we get used to that higher level of stress. And so what is stress? Stress is a perception. What is perception? It's a thought. So we can link our thoughts to illness. And we can show that in a laboratory now. Uh, so, you know, illness is a natural result of that. And that is a, a powerful example of the brain-body connection, uh, how the brain has this power and thought has a power over the body. Conversely, we already know, and, and everyone watching this, I'm, you, I know you're aware of this, but the example I use when I'm teaching, working with a general teaching population is that uh, it's, to, it's to talk about neurogenesis and the fact that aerobic activity uh, creates new nerve cells in the hippocampus region of the brain. And that is a powerful brain-body connection uh, uh, that in the other direction where the, where the uh, body is profoundly affecting the brain. Now, what we know now is also is that the brain is the primary beneficiary of the benefits of aerobic activity. Uh, we just didn't know because we couldn't see in, and now we can see in. And, and so the brain gets a lot uh, uh a lot of benefit from from movement, physical activity, physical exercise. So to I would this is this is going to be a little different, but I always do this in my live events. So I'd like to try it with you, because you're probably sitting at home, uh, maybe not, maybe you're standing, which would be great. But I I'm going to ask you to do something a little bit different. It's going to take about ninety seconds, but I really want you to get a really uh, real sense of the brain body connection, so it sticks with you. So I'm going to ask you to stand up. Got it. Uh, hopefully, I'll describe this correctly, but you can do it. I want you to just stand with your arms at your side, and you're going to raise them so your arms are parallel to the ground. So you just, you've raised your arms at your shoulders, and you're going to twist one way or the other. I don't care which way, and twist as far as you can. When you can't twist that way anymore, mark that spot on the wall, come back so your arms are at your side, and then put your arms down. And this is a great activity to do with your kids as well. The next thing I'm going to do is ask you to close your eyes. Everything I ask you to do from this moment forward is with your eyes closed and your arms are not going to move. You're not going to twist. You're going to do it all in your imagination or your, your mind's eye only. So if you would, close your eyes and in your mind's eye only, raise your arms and twist the same way you did before. And about, I want you to mark the original spot and then come back, put your arms down, 
keep your eyes closed. And once again, I want you to raise your arms in your mind's eye only in your imagination and twist. There's the original mark. I want you to move 12 inches past the original mark. Mark that spot on the wall and come back. There's the original mark. Arms are at your side. You can put them down with your eyes still closed. Raise your arms once again. You're only doing this in your mind. Twist. There's the original mark. There's the 12 inch mark. Now go six inches past the original mark to 18 inches past the original mark. Mark that spot on the wall and come back. There's the 12 inch mark. There is the original mark. Arms are at your side. Put them down. Finally, last time, raise your arms in your mind's eye only. Eyes are closed and twist. There's the original mark. And you're thinking, how could I ever just do that? Then you're going to go to the 12 inch mark and the 18 inch mark. And it's comfortable. Mark that spot on the wall. Come back. There's 12. There's the original. Arms are at your side. And you can put them down. Now, would you please open your eyes? Raise your arms again and twist and see how far you can go. Now, my question would be for you, did you go much farther? And, you know, when I've done these live events all over the world with really tens of thousands of people, I've done this activity, the oohs and the ahs come out. Now I can't see your, your reaction now, but it's a, it's a powerful brain body visualization. If you're a coach, you've done this with your players that the brain can put the body in positions of physical success. So in the classroom, we have to be aware of you know, uh, that, that brain-body interplay that is always impacting learning. And our bottom line here is how to learn most effectively. How does the brain prefer to learn? So hopefully you can repeat that, uh, that activity with your kids, with your students. So let's move on. So, you know, that's, so we're talking about physical activity today, and I'm, I'm sure you're, you're well aware of what happens when you're sitting for too long. The, the problem for learning is that blood pools in the button legs. We cramp our breathing systems. We get tired. The brain thinks, hey, you've been sitting for a while. You must be sleepy. I'm going to make you sleepier. And so everything we're trying to do with learning uh, doesn't work as well when we're, when we're seated. And in fact, uh, what researchers are, are you know, really saying now is that, you know, as a culture, we look at sitting as the norm. And what do we do when we want to take a break? Stand up. And more and more uh, researchers are saying, hey, we ought to look at standing as the norm and, and, and sitting as the break. And that's happening in more and more classrooms, flexible seating, the equipment you're seeing out there. And I, I, my prediction is over the next decade or two, uh, the majority of classrooms are going to look that way, where there's standing options for kids, which is great because you can see you know, it, too much sitting has been linked to obesity, heart problems, type 2 diabetes, weight gain, etc. cetera. Um, and I would certainly encourage you to look at that video, this TED-Ed video, uh, Why Sitting is Bad for You. It's five minutes, and if you're looking to uh, maybe enlighten other teachers about this or send a little link home to parents uh, as the school year begins, you know, it's a great little video and it will help people to understand why they should be getting up, but also why our students in school are going to be getting up because sitting is not the best place to learn. Okay, I like to uh, engage teachers uh, about the, the reasons why. Why is physical activity movement effective? And there are six brain principles that I usually go through. And, uh, you know, the, again, sometimes when we're, we're live, there's some different things that I can do with it. So, but I'll be able to talk you through these and, and it won't take uh, very long after I get through them. But we'll get to some movement pieces. We'll, we'll stand up in a little bit. So the six brain principles to support using movement, uh, physical activity in the classroom. Number one, the brain responds to novelty. And so if I'm just talking to you here about novelty and about movement, about physical activity, and all of a sudden, I scream like that. Hopefully, I didn't scare anybody too bad, too badly. Um, I do that little yell because it, it shows a primal uh, pre-programming of the brain. And that is the brain is pre-programmed to notice differences. And so the brain wants to be safe first, but it responds well to novelty. Once I feel safe, I want novelty. And so movement is a great way to create novelty in the classroom. There's many other wonderful ways to do it, but novelty is a fantastic way. 
or excuse me, movement is a fantastic way to create novelty. So number two, the brain responds to movement. If I was in the room with you, I would start to walk around all over the room and I would uh, go to the back or go to the side and you would follow me naturally. I ask my audiences often, I say, hey, did, you have to stop your brain and say, you know, he's on the move, watch him. Of course not. Your brain is pre-programmed to notice the movement of others and objects in its environment and also through its own movement. Our bodies are one of the most fantastic learning tools we have, which I'll try to make those points later. So that's number two, the brain responds, pre-programmed to respond to movement. The brain is always trying to create meaning and meaning is critical uh, for uh, long-term memory. And your job as a teacher is long-term memory. End of story, period. Uh, whether a child's gonna use the information next week, next year, in 10 years, in their life that weekend, especially in a health classroom, uh, whatever it may be, we want long-term memory formation and creation and meaning is the key ingredient for that. So if I start telling you a little bit about myself, uh, I went to, I uh, graduated from Kutztown University. I went to the University of Northern Colorado for my graduate work. Uh, I was a band director and music teacher for 10 years. Uh, I have twin 20 year olds. I'm married. My wife is from Colorado. I, I play the saxophone. Just telling you all these things, your brain automatically tries to make a connection. I'm sure many of you are saying, hey, I lived in Colorado, or I live in Colorado, or I play the saxophone, or, uh, you know, I used to bodybuild. I've run 10 mile races. Maybe there's, we're talking to PE and health folks that would find, you'd find some more meaning there. But there's a part of your brain called the hippocampus that searches long term memory stores for relevancy. And, and that happens always. And if a brain can't find relevancy, it's really hard for it to make memories. Again, that's your bottom line of your job. And so it's important to create meaning for kids, and you can do that easily through movement and physical activity. Number four is an obvious one. The brain thrives on concrete experience. And so uh, you know, the, the brain wants to do. On some level, at some point, to be very good at something, you have to do it. Uh, whether you're a teacher, lawyer, doctor, dentist, you have to, uh, at some point, put the book away and get out of the lecture hall, and you have to experience it. Were you a great teacher at the end of your first two years of undergrad? Probably not. After student teaching, you got a little better. And then one year, three years, five years, 10 years, the concrete experience is helpful and what the brain demands to be uh, really thriving at something. So uh, whenever it's possible to take an experience that is you know, written in a book, put on a PowerPoint coming out of your mouth and make it real for your students and concrete, their brain's going to latch on to it all the more because that's how the brain prefers to learn through implicit concrete experience. Uh, and that's, again, easy to do through movement, physical activity. Emotions help the brain remember experiences. I'm going to ask you to do something. Um, for the next few moments, I'd like you to remember your most powerful memories. Go. And you can stop because I know they're already there. And I would ask you, did they have an emotional content? And I'm 99%, if not 100% of you will raise your hand and say yes. Uh, emotion is powerful. Uh, in remembering experiences and uh, movement and physical activity can create those emotional experiences. Uh, I mean, most of the time, almost all the time, really fun uh, emotional experiences and it can help the brain to remember things more easily. Every time new learning, new data comes into the brain, part of the brain called the amygdala tries to detect emotional content. If it does it strongly enough, it'll boost chemicals in the brain, um, parts of the brain that are responsible for long-term memory, and you have it forever. Uh, it's a pretty powerful thing. So we can create those experiences through movement. And finally, the brain needs social and environmental interaction, and people need that to different degrees. There's no question. Some people get their energy from a group. Some people getting their energy or being away from the group and coming back. But movement, physical activity can create easily create social uh, and environmental interactions. You know, much of what my co-author and co-designer Tracy Lengel, what we write about and the activities that we put forth, many of them uh, are in pairs or they're in small groups or they're in larger groups. And so it becomes a social experience. 
So those are six brain principles that support using physical activity. And I think as you really take off with this and begin to use it, uh, you know, and I'm sure many of you are already, it's important to understand uh, some of the brain science on a very basic level uh, so, that, so that you can justify it, so that you can understand it, so you can help your kids understand it. So these are just some ideas to think about. Okay, uh, you know what? I think, um, why don't we take a break real quick? Not a long break, I mean, just stand up. If you're sitting down, why don't you stand up? And I'm missing a T up there. Well, isn't that nice? Why does movement enhance he learning process? And, it, <laughs> and we meant the. I, I thought for sure it was health education. So <laughs> that's right. You know what? That's what it was, Matt. That's yep. right. Yep. <laughs> why, why does movement enhance health education learning process? There we go. So if you want to stay standing for this, that's fine. We're going to get some movement activities uh, uh, soon here that I can at least talk you through. Um, so one, it provides a break from learning. And as, as far as the brain is concerned, and now we're really getting into best practices in a health classroom, in a classroom, any classroom. These are best practices, this is why. You're providing your students' uh, brains with a break. Uh, and as, again, as far as the brain is concerned, shorter is usually better. We have a very small working memory that can be overwhelmed. It often gets overwhelmed in school. So especially if you teach in a block schedule where you're you know, 80, 90 minutes, uh, two hours sometimes, it's critical that you understand that, uh, and again, I make suggestions. I'm not, I don't like to use the word should. I make suggestions based on, on you know, research and best practice, and you get to make the decisions on how you want to implement or if you want to implement. So when I talk about these things, I'm offering. So. We, wanted, we want to break the learning down instead of doing a long learning lesson. Uh, if you have 80 minutes, we're looking at doing four 20-minute lessons with a break in between. You give new content, you let them rehearse the information. That's the way you get information from uh, working memory to long-term memory. And then you review a little bit, and then you give them a break. You give them a brain break, boost, blast, energizer, whatever you want to call it. There's different reasons for different terms. Uh, but you, you get them away from the content. Uh, there's some action research that shows that when they're away from the content, they get a little laughter, a little blood flow, a little cortisol burst. They're a bit more attentive, and they're able to retrieve information more effectively. Uh, so that's, that's something to think about. So then you bring them back for another 20 minute period where they learn, they rehearse, they learn a little bit more and then they give them a break. So break learning down. Um, so number two, enhances episodic memory. Your uh, brain is always creating a learning address for where we learn something. And so uh, when I'm with a live group and we're going through things, I say, where is the best spot? Uh, if I test you tomorrow, where would I, you know, where would I have you sit that next day? And they say, in our seats. Yeah, that is correct. In the same seat you're in today, because your brain, again, is creating this learning address for where you learn something. I'm going to ask you a question again, and the answer will come to you almost immediately, uh, especially if you live here in the United States. Um, uh, and, and that is, where, where were you when you heard about 9-11 for the very first time? And uh, that will come right back to you. And the fact that you can remember uh, the incident at all is your emotional memory lane. The fact that you can know your surrounding and your circumstances and the environment is episodic memory. So how do we use that to our advantage in the classroom? Several ways. Uh, say we're doing, uh, I'm going to give you a health example in, in a little bit. But say we're doing circumference and diameter in a math class. And you have a circle of kids. Another student walks his steps around the circle, then walks his steps through the circle. Well, you've just done the relationship between circumference and diameter, which is the fact that circumference is a bit more than three times the diameter of the circle. There is an episodic advantage for that. So John is the side of Mary and Sally. He can see where he is in space. His brain can more easily remember that sensory information and that episodic information. It becomes three-dimensional. It becomes implicit. And that episodic piece kicks in. So now it's away from the book. It's away from the PowerPoint. It's away from your discussion piece. And I'm not against those things. They're all important. 
whether it be reading, discussion, note-taking, listening, lecture, they all have their place. Uh, but when we can give kids an episodic piece or a concrete piece, they're all the more likely to uh, remember the information. The other thing that I would suggest to you uh, is having to do with episodic memory is if you know you have kids in assigned seats, I would suggest that you move kids by topic, by content, by unit, by chapter, etc. That you don't do it once a month and you don't do it because uh, these two kids aren't getting along or because it's Friday uh, or, keep, or keep them in seats the whole year, the same seats that can create confusion. Let them learn something in one seat, test on it, then move them to another seat uh, and, and start the new information. So that's just a, uh, a, a thought for you. But number three, provides opportunity for implicit learning. So implicit learning is emotionally based and it's movement based. It is learning that happen, often happens uh, below our, our conscious awareness. And most school learning happens explicitly. Again, whether it's through reading, writing, um, discussion, listening. And, and we want to give more implicit opportunities and movement and physical activity to do that. Let me ask you a question. How many people that are in this audience today remember, if you live in the United States, remember the first 10 presidents of the United States? Almost none of you could do it. Maybe one or two, but probably not. And the reason is it was done implicitly. It's implicit information. Uh, you learned it a long time ago. You forgot about it. It's not important, so it has no meaning. Who cares? I can Google it, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, I'll ask another question. How many people in here can change a light bulb? Now that answer changes things. And so you watch somebody do it once or twice. You tried it yourself once or twice and you had it for life and we take it for granted. I'm telling you that's power. It could be that the brain prefers to learn the way I described the presidents, but it doesn't. I, just, I think it's just probably as easy to remember 10 names as it is, you know, 10 names as it is to learn a light to, to uh, switch uh, a light bulb out. But it's, it's just not. And so we take for granted, you know, this is easy, but it's really how the brain prefers to do things. That's why it's easy. So the more that we can bring implicit learning opportunities through movement into the classroom, or through physical activity into the classroom, the more successful your kids are going to be. Uh, next is provides an opportunity for differentiating instruction. There are different ways to do that in a health classroom. We can do it through readiness. We can do it through interest, all powerful ways. We can do it through learning profile. And this differentiates through learning profile. The majority of your kids are at the very least uh, uh, kinesthetic or visual learners. The number for auditory learners used to be a lot higher and it has dropped. Television changed everything. And so uh, now we have uh, visual learners and kinesthetic learners, a nice mix. And this allows them to learn the, the way that they prefer to learn. Uh, so uh, number five, sensory engagement. The brain stores information through sensory cues. Um, this is another sensory cue for the brain that we usually don't use as the norm in a classroom. And so it's another opportunity. So number six, this is important. Uh, the best available manager of state. So I'm going to ask you to stand up right now because I want to change your state. And I want you to get into a woman, a woman, a wonder woman pose. So I want you to put your feet just a little bit wider than shoulder, put your elbows out and your hands on your hips and your chin up and your head up and you are a superhero. Or uh, if you don't want to do that. I've totally just... got this, man. I've totally got this. <laughs> <laughs> That's great, Matt. You, know, you, you, you can also take your hands off your hips and put your arms up in the air. Just, you know, you would just take your elbows out, your hands away from your hips and put them up. It's still a powerful position. So what research tells us is that right now, your um, <clears throat> uh, testosterone levels are rising for the next two minutes and your cortisol levels are dropping because you're in a powerful, powerful position. Uh, you can stay there as I talk because it's nice to be standing, taking a little bit of a, a you know, brain energizer. Uh, what I want to say is that if you can imagine somebody sitting with their legs crossed uh, and their, their one arm around their waist and the other around their neck, 
that is the least powerful position the researchers found. And so during that, uh, when someone's like that, their cortisol levels rise and their testosterone levels uh, drop. So we want the opposite. We want to. We want kids to feel great. And this whole thing is centered around something. A little bit of a, a Tony Robbins takeaway that your physiology can change your psychology. So why is managing state so important? Why is it critical to do in your health classroom every day? Well, I'm going to borrow a sentence. It's, it's in both of our books now, uh, uh, but I'm going to borrow from Eric Jensen. And he says that meaning making is state dependent. That is the most important sentence I will say all day. Meaning making is state dependent. Remember that there are two criteria for remembering things in the long term. Does it make sense? Does it have meaning? And remember, I said that long-term memory is the most important part of your job. So now you know the two criteria for that. And meaning is the most powerful. So the most critical part of your job and, you know, creating meaning is the most critical part of long-term memory formation because underneath meaning lies an emotion. If you love something, if it's meaningful, it's got an emotion underneath. And so that's why it's so powerful. And so I'm asking you to manage kids' states. If, you gotta, if you're looking out, you know, you're 30 minutes into a class and you're looking out over your, your students or your audience and you're seeing poor posture, eyes drifting everywhere, yawns, I beg you to stop what you're doing and manage their state. Get them up, get them moving, get them laughing for a minute, get them back in their seats now hit them with the important content because they have a much better shot at, at uh, you know, really engaging with the content in a powerful way because they're in a better state. You know what else is a great state manager? Music. If I say to you, theme from the movie Rocky, just saying that changes your state, doesn't it? You heard the theme. Some of you may have seen yourself running up the steps or seen Rocky running up the steps. Changes your state. And so just, you know, I would really start to look into that because that's something that's not in most teachers' bags. They don't get it in their undergrad. They rarely get it in PD. They rarely get it in grad school. And it is critical. You know, our, the cultural norm in learning uh, in the United States is you come in, you sit, you listen, uh, you don't talk, you know, you get the content. You know, we'll do some group work, et cetera, et cetera. But, you know, we're not paying attention to student states and they need to be up and moving uh, several times, even during a 45, 50 minute class period. Uh, to, to really to manage their state. So important for learning. Finally, number seven, provides motivation in the meeting of basic human needs. And I'll go through this quickly. I mean, you know, I always ask people at the end of, of a PD or a keynote or whatever, hey, have you been more motivated today when I've been talking or when you've been moving? Of course, the answer is moving. Moving, uh, movement, kinesthetic activity, physical activity provide, the, 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 well, let me say the best um, you know, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? The motivation is the greatest takeaway. It's the greatest benefit. You get a motivated student because you're meeting their needs. Glasser says that we have five basic human needs. They are survival, belonging, power or competence, freedom, and fun. And he doesn't say, hey, let's have a party. Let's have fun. He says fun is the natural payoff, a uh, natural human payoff for learning. But when you look at all that, you got a kid who sits all the time uh, and he never is able to get up. Just standing up meets a survival need. We, uh, the kinesthetic activities we use in a classroom build community in pairs and threes and groups and large groups. And they meet that, uh, uh, you know, the, the need of um, uh, being social and, and needing each other and belonging. Power, we learn through our body creates power, creates confidence in a way that kids prefer to do things. Then we take a look at freedom. Schools are restrictive places because they have to be. I understand that. But in a classroom, when they get to move, there's a new sense of freedom. That creates motivation. And finally, fun, no brainer. You bring physical activity into your classroom. You will create a level of fun and interest and engagement. Students are going to want to be a part of your classroom. And those five things, rather than uh, you know, trying to, to create 
behavior modification all the time. No, beating them to the punch, creating uh, a classroom that meets needs, which includes movement. It's not the only way to do it, but includes movement and physical activity. You're going to have motivated kids. And let me just say, you know, a big word in education right now is mindfulness. When kids are moving, they automatically become mindful. They have to be engaged. It's a mindful, stress-lowering activity uh, in most cases. And so it, there, there's just so many benefits uh, to, to creating uh, movement and physical activity or using it in your, in your health classrooms. Okay, the six purposes. And this was put out first in our first graduate course in our first book. And this framework has changed a little bit in our latest book, which just came out this summer. All these six parts are still there. They're just rearranged a little bit. So I'm, I'm still presenting on, on the way that we once created the, the framework. And, and so I'll, I'll get to the other way soon. I have to get used to it. You know, we've had this for about uh, eight, 10 years now, but they're all there. So six purposes, prepare the brain. Uh, we'll talk about each one of these in a little bit greater detail. We can. Uh, create uh, better brains for learning by doing uh, so certain activities. And I'm going to have you go through some when we get there in a moment. Provide brain breaks or energizers, blasts, or boosts. And I know there's a few people out there that I <laughs> probably take issue with the fact that we call them breaks. And the reason that we did that and still do that is because of working memory capacity. Uh, it's very, very small. And as an adult, you can hold five to nine bits of unrelated pieces of information at one time, which is nothing. Um, and so the brain needs breaks from content. Now, do they energize? Absolutely. Do they provide blasts, boosts? A absolutely. So, uh, you know, take your pick. Uh, they, they're, they're doing the same thing. And uh, they, they, the, the brain is not actually taking a break really it's still working but it's just getting away from the content that's why we use that there so you're 20 minutes into a class you know essential that you get kids up have to uh, because they're just going to start to scan their environment for threats it's biological you have your kids in minutes for about how old they are as far as attention goes uh, you know you're working with 12 13 year olds you got them for about 12 13 minutes and beyond that you're taking your chances uh, remember, the brain is always paying attention, probably just not to you. And so we want to make sure that, that we have their attention. And you do that by managing state and offering these, these movement opportunities. Uh, number three, supporting exercise and fitness is just a part of the framework. Look, it's something that's happening all over this conference. It's not something I need to go in uh, into great detail. But uh, I, I, I will say, you know, the, the research is so robust now, uh, and it's really another topic than the health classroom. But there are ways that the classroom teacher can support that. Uh, there are, you know, one, two minute really getting up in their heart rate activities. There are three to five minute exercises that you can do with kids. You can do challenges. You know, we're, we're uh, calling them uh, Max 60s in our new book where for 60 seconds kids are doing exercises for hard as, as hard as they can and it, it shows kids from a teacher perspective it shows kids that their fitness life now let me change that that yeah their fitness life is critically important to their academic life most kids don't know that most students don't know that uh and and we need to be the role models for that their, their fitness life is critical to their academic life because, you know, two things changed our mind about including, it would have been easy not to include this, but Tracy and I made a decision based on the fact that number one, we know that physically fit kids do better academically. And we also know that one in three kids born in the year 2000 are going to be type two diabetics in the United States. And it's, they're crazy numbers. And so we just felt it was important for teachers uh, in the classroom to also uh, support exercise and fitness along with what the physical educator in the school is doing. So number four, create class cohesion. Um, yeah, this is one that, uh, you know, academic research tells us that when kids build relationships between each other and when relationships are built between teachers and students, that academic achievement rises. And so we can do lots of different wonderful activities for creating class cohesion. Uh, you know, it's not the only way to create class cohesion or team building, but it's a fantastic way to do it. And it's a decision you have to make. An elementary school teacher, 
um, uh, is going to do this, you know, most days, uh, middle school, high school teacher has a, has a different decision to make, you know, in your health classroom, how is, it, how important is it for you to build a home for the mind? How important is it for you to create a place where kids are free to make mistakes? I think mistakes are of great importance. It gives you free information about what not to do next time. And kids have, need to look at that in a, in a different way. You know, mistakes are fantastic. And I'll borrow from Tony Robbins again, as long as they are a teacher and not a jailer. And, and we need to create communities and create environments. You know, emotional environment creates intellectual achievement. We need to create an environment that allows for that. Uh, so there's many ways to do that. And I encourage you to dig deep in there and make some decisions about uh, about doing that in your classroom on a, on a, on a somewhat regular basis, because that's important for risk taking. Kids need to be educational risk takers. And the way they do that is from comfort in the classroom. Okay. And then the last two are pretty obvious, uh, reviewing content and teaching content. A lot of different ways to review content, a lot of different ways. I mean, teaching content is only limited by your imagination. So uh, over the next, uh, you know what, eight, 10 minutes or so, I want to show you a few activities from each part of the framework. Uh, I don't know that we'll uh, do these particular activities, but uh, I certainly can, can walk you through if you want to try and do it. Uh, and, and prepare the brain. I've had some wonderfully rich discussions about this lately, about specifically crossing the midline. Um, and, and what we've always said in our books is that uh, the research is young and inconclusive about crossing the midline. And I, I think Eric Jensen says it best, where he says, though it makes very good sense uh, when you're trying to prevent uh, uh, you know, laterality and, and, you know, hemispheric preference and kids preferring one side or the other. And you can't teach to one side or the other, and you're not entirely one side or the other. Um, but logically it makes sense to be able to do these activities, uh, to help with, with, uh, uh, with maybe with whole brain thinking, even though there's certainly just not the research out there to support it. At any rate, they can be used as brain breaks. There is some research out there to support it, uh, just not of the highest quality. Uh, it's not that it's, it's bad, but it, there's, it's just not the highest quality it could be. So you take those with, with a grain and understanding what that means. And, uh, you know, they can be used as brain breaks or brain boosts, and we can move forward that way. But the other part of preparing the brain uh, is a little bit different. There is research to support that, but let's let's talk about this midline first. So, if you want to if you want to try it, uh, try this. What you're going to do is stand up at your. At, all right, good. <laughs> and you are simply going to start by tapping your toe, crossing your right foot over your left, and tapping your toe on that side of your body. Come back, take your left foot, cross over, tap your. Uh, left foot over the right side of the body and just go back and forth. So there's a step to get back to normal and a step out. And you just keep going. I'm doing it on my chair right now. And if you want to, you can add the hand clap. So you're going to clap on the side of your body that you're tapping. So just a simple little clap, clap, and make sure your arms reach out to the side of the body that you're tapping. Now, uh, I'm going to give a shout out to Justin Schleider. We've had some good conversations about this recently. Oh, he'll and, like that. <laughs> <laughs> and he, you know, he is doing a, a lot of reading and research about bilateral movements. And okay. this, this counts in a, in a bilateral uh, movement sense. And so I would, there is research to support um, bilateral movement with uh, some academic benefit. So that I encourage you to look at that. There's another part to this prepare the brain thing that is uh, uh, about vestibular system and about closing developmental gaps. Developmental gaps being maybe a child didn't crawl. Maybe a child was in a car seat for great periods of time and their peripheral vision is not what it should be. There's just, they come to school with these different gaps and things like the action-based learning lab work on spinning and they work on balance and they work on content at the same time they're doing these activities like cup stacking or 
ju uh, rope jumping, et cetera, et cetera. So there's activities in the book that are specifically written for vestibular system development, which helps us to keep things still in our, in our visual space, which helps us to go from left to right on a page, um, which helps us balance. It's one of the earliest brain systems to develop, and we can help that along. Let me give you an example of an activity. I'm again going to ask you, to, if you're not still standing, to stand up once again. Stand uh, tall, and I want you to put your left, grab, take your right hand and grab your left foot behind your body. Okay, so I've got my left foot in my hand, uh, in my right hand, behind my right leg. And I'm going to hop in a circle to the right. And when you get back to the center, hop the other way to the left. Now you're going to change and bring your left foot behind your right leg. Grab onto your um, right foot with your left hand. Do the same thing. Spin one way and then spin the other. So that's just another one of the activities we have in the Prepare the Brain chapter in that first kinesthetic classroom book. That is helping us with balance and with spinning and helping with vestibular system development. So I am going to move on from Prepare the Brain. Providing brain breaks, folks, I'm going to move quickly past this because there are more brain breaks, boosts, uh, energizers that you can shake a stick at. All you need to do is go to Google and put in brain break or brain boost or brain energizers and you'll come up with so many different activities. There's books written on brain breaks. Our chapters, we have entire chapters on them. So there's so many different ways to do this, but they are critical. These are the fun ones. Um, you know, you're, you're 20 minutes into a class, 30 minutes into a class, you stand kids up. A lot of times they're partnering activities. Sometimes they're not. You know, one example is when we write things in the air with our heads and our elbows and our, and our hips. Uh, we call that body writing. So there's a lot of different ways to do that. And there's a lot of resources. In fact, um, you know, brain boosts and physical fitness have become the poster children of the movement movement, if you will. And, and this framework provides a bigger, um, bigger uh, perspective on the teaching and learning process and best practice using movement and physical activity. Uh, and, and so, yeah, while there's a lot of resources on brain breaks, um, certainly that you can use. Creating class cohesion. Uh, again, you know, we've talked about the benefit. My favorite all-time activity is this one. Uh, without reading all that text, <laughs> you simply get kids in a circle. You have a class of 25, two circles of 12. And if you can have balloons in your school, you have them take hands uh, they, and they tap a balloon in the air keep it in the air without letting go of hands and off the floor. They can use their elbows, chins, nose, uh, clasped hands, feet, knees, whatever. And it is the most fun activity. You keep adding balloons, two, three, four. And it, you know, kids are you know, getting this uh, non-threatening touch, which we need as humans. They are laughing together. They're building team. They are cooperating. They're communicating. Fantastic activity for creating class cohesion. And there's dozens and dozens and dozens and dozens more. But this is just one to give you an example. And the benefits of it are not only physical, your heart rate goes up, your, there's part of your vein called the endothelium that gets a, a boost um, um, when, you, when you laugh. And, and, and move and laugh. And so it's for some research at the University of Maryland. So a lot of benefits here in creating class cohesion. And reviewing content. Uh, again, I'm not, I'm not even, this is too complicated to go through this. Uh, the PowerPoint is there, you can read through it. Uh, but it's a fantastic way to review content. And these content review activities, the two biggest benefits, I think, are all kids are engaged in the review and they're active, and it's safe. You know, they're the kids who never answer a question in a classroom answers it here. Uh, they're, they're wonderful ways to review content using physical activity. Finally, teaching content, and I'm just gonna talk you through this real quick. You don't have to read through that whole thing right now. Uh, I, I love this activity. It's, it, it's about insulin resistance. You have two rows of chairs facing each other. You create a, a, you know, what is a bloodstream between the, in the aisleway between the two rows, 
and you have kids that will sit in each one of those chairs, line up at the beginning of the, of the uh, aisle that you've created. They are sugar molecules. You've just eaten a Twinkie. You got sugar running around the bloodstream. The chairs are cells. The aisle between the chairs is a bloodstream. You've got a kid on the other end who has a broom because one of insulin's roles, when you, you know, of course, when you um, have sugar in the bloodstream, you've got a, you've got a uh, insulin release. One of insulin's roles is to clear the bloodstream of sugar into cells so you can use it for future use. So kid goes down, he sweeps the feet of the, of the sugar walking in the bloodstream. They yell, sugar in the bloodstream. All the kids sit down in the seats, right? Perfect functioning system. Go back and do it again. This time, every third or fourth kid sit down only. The rest of you stay in the bloodstream and go to the other side. Insulin starts in, sugar in the bloodstream. Kid walks right by him. Kid walks right by him. That kid sits down. Well, you see where this is going. It, it, we're just trying to describe kinesthetically the process of insulin resistance and where it can lead. And, and so it's, it's a fantastic activity. And the bottom line, going back to implicit learning, going back to episodic memory, can this kid go home that night and show their parents? Can they teach it in their kitchen? And the answer is almost always yes. If they were lectured at, if they saw the PowerPoint, if they read about it, it's probably 50-50. So, you know, again, doing these things, learning with the body, using kinesthetic activity, using physical activity for the things that we need to teach is probably the most powerful way for you to teach them. Not going to touch everybody, but most kids, you know, are, are going to really uh, think of this as a way to, that they can learn easily. So that is uh, teaching content. And that is the framework. Prepare the brain, providing brain breaks. Uh, creating class cohesion, extra sporting exercise and fitness, reviewing content, teaching content. And just briefly to take us to the end, a few other thoughts. How much time spent moving? You know, that's, a, that's your decision. Uh, I think kids should never sit more than 15 or 20 minutes. If you're in a session with me at a conference or a school or whatever, you don't ever sit for more than 10 minutes ever. Uh, and, and that's just how, kind of my, it happens naturally. Uh, but you know, it, it's a decision that you'll have to make, but they should be up. They'll be more effective for you, more efficient for you. That blood flow around the brain and body you know, after they sit down will make them more effective and efficient. Uh, class management, you know, some teachers get concerned about this. How do I get my kids back? Those are all great questions. And for the time we have now, I promise you on the anecdotal um, uh, research we have on the research we have showing the kids are in principal's offices a whole lot less come to school more um, that this will be your best friend as a classroom manager but you just have to educate them as to why and educate them as to how and start out slowly if you're not really doing this right now and move forward slowly get them used to it and they'll love it and they'll do what you want them to do you're meeting their basic human needs Finally, um, everyone's aware of Go Noodle. Love Go Noodle. Um, there are uh, another company called Fitbound that's doing some great work with videos that you, uh, you might want to check out. Uh, move to learn ms.org is a free resource because it's meant for the kids, the kids that go to school in Mississippi. So it's just free to their teachers. They are wonderfully done videos. I would check them out. Uh, check out that website. There's also an advocacy video there if you go to about Move to Learn. But it's about 14 minutes long. Um, and uh, it's, it's a fantastic video, K-12. You can send it to your parents, send it to your administrators, send it to other teachers. It's good stuff. State health officials, superintendents, uh, lots of teachers and students in that video. And if you're interested in a little bit of a recap, it's only 16 minutes long of what we talked about today. There's the link for my TEDx talk that I did uh, a couple of years back. So I thank you very, very much, everyone who's involved in putting this conference together for having me. If you need to get in touch with me, uh, you can do it through my website. You can do it through my uh, email. And again, thank you and have a great rest of the day and conference. Yeah, thank you again, Mike, for being here. Um, you know, lots of good conversation happening in the Tazel, but I think a lot of people were doing a lot of reflection as well. And, uh, you know, just really thinking about what they can do. And um, not only that, but just taking it back to their schools and sharing it uh, as well. Because um, I think a lot of us are doing, you know, most of those things. And um, I think it is taking it to that next level too. Like how do we continue to share this with more and more people? So very much appreciated and always good having that background information um, as we implement this stuff with our classes too. Um, and I've remembered this thought for 
five or six years when we had a PD on braid-based learning, that the fact that when the students have an emotional connection to something, it equals higher level of learning. So that was just definitely one thing that stuck with me. And when they're uh, up, active, engaged, like you say, the social, whatever it is, but they have that emotional connection, that learning is so much higher. And um, it's been a continued uh, focus of mine to keep that going. So uh, we really, really appreciate you sharing your thoughts and you being here with us today. Um, those of you that are in the Tazel, a couple of reminders. Uh, Bill Bodie just went and posted the um, Flipgrid link. So again, tell us in 30 seconds, uh, you know, what you're going to take from Mike and what you're going to implement in your classroom. Um, just to share that out so everyone can kind of hear that as well. It's, it's a cool way of doing it. And uh, lots of great things coming up. Um, so again, we just appreciate you taking your time being here. And thanks for tuning in, everyone. And uh, Mike, it was really nice to have you. Thank you very much, Matt. Uh, I appreciate it and have a great rest of the conference. All right, we sure will. Everyone else, enjoy the rest of the Phys Ed Summit. Uh, thank you. And I think Mike can even hop in the Tazel a little bit and see what people were chatting about. <laughs> he was pretty busy, so um, I know he can kind of jump back in there. So if there are always other questions, you can, you can drop those in there. And Mike, I think we'll just get your, I don't think there was a link to the presentation in there and there was a few people that asked about that. So we'll, uh, we'll make sure that we can get the, the link to the presentation or that file in there as well. Uh, okay, we'll make that happen. All right. Thank you very much. And for everyone um, that's been watching, um, I am Matt Pomeroy, and we are signing off for this hour of the Phys Ed Summit. Uh, until next time, see ya.